This week's blog post is on the Princeton Battle Monument in Princeton, New Jersey. On January 3rd, 1777, General George Washington and his tattered American forces defeated a British force at Princeton, New Jersey. Coming just a week after the Americans surprised the British at Trenton, the victory provided a second, much-needed boost to patriot morale. The 50-foot-tall Princeton Battle Monument was conceived more than a century after the battle. Frederick McMonies was the sculptor and Thomas Hastings the architect. The firm Carrere and Hastings was responsible for such buildings as the New York Public Library at 42nd and 5th. The sculpture was in progress for 15 years, at first because the Monument Committee and McMonies disagreed on the design, then because the committee couldn't agree on a site, it was finally positioned on Stockton Street in Princeton, and finally because of the Great War, also known as the First World War. The work was carved on site by the Picciarelli brothers, with finishing touches added by McMonies. It was dedicated 10 days after the Lincoln Memorial, whose monumental portrait sculpture was created by Daniel Chester French, the other important American sculptor working at that time. The monument and the memorial are both examples of the City Beautiful movement. This is what McMonies wrote of the Princeton Battle Monument in 1918, four years before its dedication. Quote, it is essential in making a permanent work of art in sculpture that every line, every form in it should not only express to the utmost capacity the spirit or sentiment of the movement, but at the same time should be woven into a pattern which also affects the eye, as chords or arrangements of chords affect the ear and hold the attention long enough to express the central idea, in this case of disaster, defeat, misery, suffering, despair, triumphed over and forgotten and cast aside by the unconquerable spirit of love of liberty." End of quote. This is not one of my favorite McMoney sculptures. I prefer his earlier works, such as the Bicante with Infant Fawn and Nathan Hale. The complicated group on the Princeton Battle Monument is more reminiscent of his sculptures for the Soldiers and Sailors Arch at Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. But, as one of McMoney's major later works, the monument is certainly worth a look. Unfortunately, at the moment it's badly in need of a cleaning, and the dark stains sometimes make it difficult to tell what's going on. But let's look at it. From Stockton Street you see only the side of the monument. To see the front, you have to park your car and then walk around it. So it's not meant to be something that you just see in passing, flying by. At the top center of the monument is Washington, seated on a horse. The standards to the left, these things over here, suggest the presence of far more soldiers than are actually shown in the relief. Directly below Washington is the dynamically twisting figure of Liberty wearing a Phrygian cap and brandishing the torch of freedom. So her face is here in profile. This is the torch and she's twisting and turning. These are her feet down here. Really difficult to tell with the stains. At the lower left in this picture, a soldier supports the body of General Hugh Mercer, who died at the Battle of Princeton. Mercer is identifiable by his epaulets here. There's a brief reference to Mercer in Hamilton, an American musical. The Mercer legacy is secure, and all he had to do was die. At the lower right of the relief is a young drummer boy who's wrapped in rags with his toes sticking out from his shoes. So here's his face, here's his drum, these are his toes. On the side of the monument facing the street are an eagle and an arrangement of swords, cannon, and other accoutrements of war. This is the side facing the street. On the opposite side is a similar arrangement, an eagle with more accoutrements of war. At the base of that side there is a sphere with the terse legend, Skull or Liberty. Unfortunately I don't have close-ups to show me what this coat of arms is. And finally there is the inscription on the back of the monument. Here memory lingers to recall the guiding mind whose daring plan outflanked the foe and turned dismay to hope when Washington with swift resolve marched through the night to fight at dawn and venture all in one victorious battle for our freedom. And the lines below that are Latin, saecula praeteriunt rapimur nos ultramorantes ad sis tu patria saecula qui dirigis. Roughly translated, that means, centuries pass by, we who linger are also carried off. Aid our homeland, you who guide the centuries. 
And that's it. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantiWriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.